been on that thread then of of relationships um obviously you and your, your husband jordan have had a long relationship you've been through a lot together i've heard jordan on podcasts and interviews be brought to tears when talking about your relationship and and the love that you have what do you think the core principles of a happy and healthy relationship are well when jordan first asked me to marry him uh he told me that if we didn't tell the truth our relationship couldn't work mm -hmm. and so that was going to be and that was when he was 25 something like that uh and um so that was the first thing that we were to tell the truth and i hadn't really understood what that meant i first took that to mean my truth in what the truth in in my relationships what i'm uh where my goals are to make sure that that was all truthful um, so that was the first, so honesty, honesty was paramount and he still talks about that as being very, very important. And so that is what got us started and really took us through the, uh, the other thing was that not, we, we didn't let, we didn't. If there was a problem, we didn't just let it go. It might have taken three days <laughs> in the beginning to uncover what was happening because uh, we both were pretty strong he headed and probably didn't really want to admit that we had done anything to cause the trouble. So in the early days, but we, we didn't give up on it. Uh, he was very good at even though he doesn't like conflict, he's a very soft-hearted, very compassionate person, as you can tell uh, through his public image. He's a very compassionate person, um, but he would, and knowing that this would be uncomfortable, he would still insist that we talk about it until we understood it, and that was really good. We got through a lot of trouble by perseverance and you know at the end of every mystery in the rosary you pretty much pray for perseverance it, it's all about trying again and getting up and trying again and getting up and trying again no matter what logic reason mathematics would probably suggest to us that there's no such thing as the one but I think everyone in relationships, they like to think there's a one. They like to, they want to find their one. And I think taking that logic and mathematic hat off, I like to believe in the one. So how did you know that your husband was the one? Um, well, we were very close friends. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed each other's company when we were kids. I thought he was, he was, smart back then he was fascinating to be around he had different ways of looking at things and and dissecting problems and you know when we were really little we played with a chemistry set you know we liked that and he really liked that and i got to be a part of that he taught me how to play chess when i was a little kid that was really great and i was five years younger than my siblings so i didn't really grow up with my family i grew up with my friends and he was one of the friends that i grew up with and I never got tired of being with him. And then when I left home when I was 18 and didn't really see him that much until I was in my 20s or my, my, my mid-20s. And I went to, he called me and had moved within a couple of hours of where I lived when we were in our 20s. Uh, and I went to visit him and he was getting his PhD, so it looked like he was getting his life together. He was uh, taking responsibility for himself and moving forward. And I thought, you know, if I don't marry him, I won't know what happens in his life as I do now. 
And so if I want to be, if I want to know what happens in his life, I'll have to marry him in order to be there. And, you know, I, his dad was my school teacher. He was a good father. So I thought Jordan would be a good father and he was interesting. And I wanted to be with somebody who was interesting. And so that's how I decided to marry him. He told his dad in grade five that he was going to marry me. So he decided a very long time ago. And I don't know when I learned that. I wasn't that young when I learned that. So it, it wasn't something that I knew about. But he was always there, you know, even when I wasn't seeing him, I was going home. Uh, I lived in Montreal and I was going home to Northern Alberta at Christmas. And he, his, his family lived in, in this little town too. When I got home, it was so often that he would come to see me that I would know within a half an hour of getting home that he would knock on my door. So he was a constant friend. Uh, so he was not easily gotten rid of, I'd say. But by the time I wanted to marry him, he was getting pretty popular with the women. So I thought I better marry him quick. You had to make you move quick. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's, that's beautiful.
play you a tape. This is from a, a, a podcast in which you talked about uh, getting divorced. It was very, very difficult to get divorced considering what my dad talks about. It made me stay in a relationship longer than I should have. I don't agree with the more conservative story of divorce that people are being told. I think being in a relationship that's not good for you, I think you should get out of that relationship. Interesting that. Uh, let me ask you, Jordan, when you heard her say that, did you feel any responsibility that she may have stayed in a very unhappy marriage for too long because she didn't want to upset you because of your views? No, I wouldn't say so. I. I'm able to let my children handle the complexity of their own private lives, knowing at least, I think as I do, that there isn't, that's a place where only fools would, would go. And I had faith that she would sort things out, you know? And so I, I'm perf I was willing to give her her space. I mean, I believe in committed marriage. And so, um, at that level of generality, obviously I have objections to the breakup of a marriage, but you know, I have faith in my daughter. And so I believe she'll, I believe she's oriented to find her way and finding your way is a complex process. And I'm willing to stand back and watch her and to provide whatever help I can along the way, but also not to interfere too much. Okay, the your uh, are you re you're remarried now, right? Yes. And your name happily. of your the name of your of your second husband? Uh, Jordan Fuller. <laughs> now, I a conspiracy theorist, psychologist. Funny. funny, I know he does. You ended up marrying a man named Jordan. Should I be reading anything into this? If I was a clinical psychologist. Oh, I have no idea. Like <laughs> like I said before, I don't know how the world works. <laughs> I don't think so. My secretary <laughs> is named Jordan too. This is very weird now. Everyone in your world yeah. is Jordan. This That's is like right. being in Barbie world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Michaela, let me ask you. with Michaela, because her husband looks like Ken. <laughs> <laughs> is that true, Michaela? Yes. <laughs> like 100% true, yeah. I want to play you both a clip. You, your dad's had a lot of feuds with people. Uh, some he starts, some he doesn't. Some he gets just gets picked on for the sake of it. There's a lot of feminists who he winds up very successfully, I would say, because they're very easy to wind up. Um, one of them is Caitlin Moran, who's currently in America, and she's using your dad a lot, uh, ranting away about him. And here's one clip of her talking about your dad. He shared a piece to his 10 million followers in which I think I do a pretty good demolishment job of his entire career and oeuvre. The advice that he gives is either the kind of stuff your mum would say for free, like make your bed, pet a cat in the street, or mad stuff about lobsters. I didn't even go to school at a university, and I was halfway through his book going, I'm fairly sure I can demolish a great deal of the logic in this book. This guy is not the smartest guy in the world. He's just a man in a waistcoat who sounds, to be honest, a bit like Kermit from The Muppet Show. <laughs> Kermit from The Muppet Show. Your thoughts? Well, that's true. I do sound a lot like Kermit from The Muppet Show. So that was the one thing she said that, that was accurate. That's not even her joke, though. No, it's that's not. That's not clever if you steal it from somebody else. No, it's an old joke. But it was a good one when it first came out. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of her? Sounds like she'd be fun at a party. Or as your mother. Yeah. <laughs> or as your Have mother. That as your yeah. mother, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Michaela, do, I bet I mean, her do you kids think Michaela that make people their like... Bed. Michaela, do you think people like Caitlin Moran, do they just basically misunderstand what your dad really is about? I don't even think they're capable of understanding what he's about. There's too much arrogance there. Mm -hmm. You can't be that arrogant and assume you know everything and then read something and learn, or read anything and learn. Right? That's why you don't cast pearls before swine, dear. <laughs> You know, Jordan, my, my sons, as I think I've told you before, are all big fans of yours. And they, they just said to me, they got one question. Which, what advice do you give uh, for children who are the children of controversial public figures? Well, you know, Michaela has leapt out and, and taken the opportunities that came along with that in the public way. 
My son Julian is a more private person and he's chosen to erect barriers around his family and not to face the public as much, although he has played his music at my lectures and, and he works with me. I think, you know, each person has to find their own way. There are great advantages to having a tremendous amount of attention devoted to you and having people offer opportunities, but each person, depending on their own temperamental proclivities, has to figure out how to manage that themselves. And mm -hmm. it's complex, but it can work. I mean, Julian, Tammy, and Michaela have all reacted to that in their own way. It took Tammy a good while, like the rest of us, to figure out what her place was, so to speak, but she's really managed that. And Tammy is out in public much more than I would have thought she would have been, um, you know, if I would have guessed if I would have been able to see into the future 10 years ago, she's become quite an accomplished public speaker, for example, and she certainly didn't think that was in her, in her cards, in the cards or in the stars. But um, things come at you and you surf the wave and, and you're happy for the opportunity. And Julian and Michaela and Tammy have all adapted in their various ways. And I think at the moment that's working like a charm. And Michaela, so, if, I, if I asked you, hooray. Michaela, obviously the family's gone through this extraordinary six, seven years or more now, involving some extraordinary challenges for you all personally, which would have happened anyway, or perhaps not actually in your, in your dad's case, but certainly for you and your mum. Um, but you've come out and you've you're got fabulously wealthier as a family, I guess, than before this started, fabulously more famous than before it started. But if I had the power to transport you back to anonymity without the fame, without the extra money and all the rest of it, would you would you take that deal? Or would you be actually quite happy where you've all washed up now? Oh, I, there's no way I would take that deal, uh, even with everything we went through. I was talking to my husband the other day about why I'm interested in making money versus why he is, and he said, he always liked expensive things, basically. And I said, I didn't, I'm like decked out right now, but I also didn't mind buying things from thrift shops and decorating my room that way. I didn't want to feel vulnerable anymore from not having enough money. And so my yearn to be successful was always so that I would be less vulnerable so that when I had a problem, I had money to help me solve it. And that was my motivation. Uh, and so I wouldn't want to go back to be before because I feel more secure and less vulnerable now.